Uh, okay, well, we're being recorded. Uh, <laughs> I'll talk to you about the, the fundamentals of VLBI and also do a quick sort of overview of, of what kind of science we can do with VLBI because we want to know we want to know why to do VLBI. Um, so what is VLBI likely? Everyone has seen this image before. It's Michael, just a minute. Um, yep. Uh, it, it, can Mervin click on continue? Um, because the the um, drop the notification is on is on our screen at this side. For sorry, sorry? The... so can Mervin accept the um, the recording, it says by continuing to be in the meeting, you are considered to be recorded. So there's leave meeting or continue. Um, um, I've, I've clicked continue. It's gone from my screen. Okay. I um, think maybe you have to click it as well because it, it may be recording you as well. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the LBI is, is, very long baseline interferometry. It's an interferometer made using radio telescopes that are not physically connected. And the reason for doing that is that it gets you very high angular resolution. If you have a typical wavelength of three centimeters and a typical baseline of 3000 kilometers, and the resolution is three centimeters over 3000 kilometers, which works out to 10 to the minus eighth radians or about two milliarc seconds. The reason we want that kind of resolution is that many astronomical objects subtend very small angles here at Earth. For example, our, if you take our sun and put it out at 10 parsecs, which is not very far in the galaxy, then it has an angular size of 0.47 milliarc seconds. The VLBI comes with its own sort of set of challenges. To actually do this, you need very accurate timekeeping. You need to keep time to fractions of a period, which is typically tens of picoseconds. And you need a very accurate measure of the distance between your telescopes um, down to fractions of a wavelength. So if your wavelength is centimeters, that's typically sort of a few millimeters. And you also need to transport all this data from the telescopes to the correlator somehow. So the basic equipment that we use these days, mostly the data is recorded on disk packs and then those are shipped to the correlator or sometimes the data is transferred over the internet. Uh, a VOBI antenna isn't really any different than any other antenna. Um, and VLBI isn't different than a normal, any other kind of interferometer. The only difference is that instead of having sort of a waveguide or fiber optics directly connecting the, the telescopes and the correlator, you've, you've broken that connection. And so to, typically you record the data at each station and then you ship the data to the correlator and then you correlate them there. Uh, VLBI antennas are mostly independent instruments that, that often were not built originally for the purpose of VLBI, like the Ghana station that you're at was built as a telecommunications antenna. Um, so VLBI arrays tend to be rather mixed compared to things like Meerkat, where you have all 64 dishes are exactly the same, or the VLA. Um, there's various sort of networks of VLBI telescopes. Paco will tell you more about that in the next talk. And the equipment themselves doesn't look all that exciting. There's a picture of a Mark V recorder and disk packs. Um, can you guys see my cursor? Yeah. Okay. And the hydrogen maser, which is the thing that's our clock. Uh, here's a, a somewhat outdated picture of the VLBI telescopes in the world. You can see there's VLBI telescopes all over the world. What's missing here for some reason is there's, there's about half a dozen, at least in Australia, that aren't indicated here. And there's some other newer ones. Um, that aren't here. One thing you might notice is that, that sort of in the Northern Hemisphere, across North America and Europe, there's a fair number of, and Asia, there's a fair number spread out. And in the South, as I said, there's, there's 
half a dozen at least in Australia, but the whole big continent of Africa, there's only Hart Rao down there. So if your object is in the south of the sky, it's a lot harder. So here's the, the I, said, I said before that what VLBI gets you is resolution. And here's sort of the resolution of things. Um, the resolution of an optical system is just given by the diameter of, of your telescope divided by the wavelength. So for an angular resolution of one arc minute, you get that at optical wavelengths with the diameter about two millimeters. So that's your eye or your pupil to be more precise. Uh, radio is a much, much longer wavelength. So you need a much, much bigger aperture. And it turns out to get one arc minute resolution at radio at, at four centimeters, you need something 140 meters across, which is bigger than the biggest fully steerable dishes we've got. The GBT is about 105 meters or so. To get a resolution of one arc second, you need about a 10 centimeter telescope in optical. So a little amateur telescope will do. Uh, with VLBI, you need eight kilometers. That's like Meerkat for the VLA and the B configuration. Uh, and then to get 0.05 arc seconds, you need about a two meter telescope in optical. It's the Hubble Space Telescope. And you need 160 kilometers in radio. Well, that's kind of like Merlin, the uh, set of linked telescopes in the United Kingdom. And to get one milliarc seconds, you need about a hundred meter, a hundred meter optical telescope. And in radio, <clears throat> which there isn't, there's optical interferometers that have telescopes 100 meters apart. In radio, you need 8,200 kilometers. So. That's where your radio telescopes are getting to be as far apart as the diameter of the Earth. And, and there's just an example of on the left is Jupiter, as you would see it with your eye at one arc minute resolution. That's what it looks like at one arc second, 0.05 arc seconds. And then at a milli arc second, we're seeing the craters on whichever of the jo Jovian satellites that is. So, if we're doing it to get this amazing resolution, what, what is it that we can look at? And the answer is pretty much anything that's sufficiently compact and a radio source can be studied with the LBI. And some of the things that, that people spend most of their time doing in VLBI is active galactic nuclei, masers that you looked at last night, supernovae and supernova remnants in other galaxies. In our own galaxy, they're they're more, the supernova remnants are more in the arc second scale. Some stars, pulsars, the, the emission we're seeing in VLBI is pretty much always non-thermal. Uh, VLBI is only sensitive to very high brightness temperatures. So you heard, you, I think basically never get thermal emission that's bright enough for VLBI. So most of the time it's synchrotron emission. So, Here's more on that resolution. This is a radio galaxy called Centaurus A. And the picture on the left here is, is an overlay of the radio and the optical. So this is the very large array. So this is sort of arc <clears throat> minute <clears throat> resolution or arc second resolution. And actually, if you zoom out and look at a much larger scale, the this is what you see, so this thing expands over 10 degrees on the sky. It's huge. This is an image done with the Hart Rao 26 meter as a single dish with a resolution of 20 arc minutes. But then if you zoom in on, here's that radio part from the left again. And if you zoom in on the very center of that, you can see there's these huge lobes that, that then expand even more that are inflated by this thing down in the center. And if you zoom into that, to VLBI resolutions, this tiny little bit here, you see there's 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 these jets that power these huge lobes that extend to many times the size of a galaxy. And, and they're powered by a black hole. And that's one of the big fields is VLBI is how does this work? How does a black hole that's that's tiny, smaller than the solar system, power these huge lobes that are many times the size of a galaxy. 
Now, here's another such galaxy. This is one called M87 uh, that has a particularly massive black hole in it. And we're now zooming into the inner two parsecs. This is 43 gigahertz VLBI, so quite a high frequency. And the scale here is a few milliarc seconds. And this is a movie made from VLBI images made on a selection of different days. You can see the day number scrolling down. It's sort of two thirds of a year. And, and we can see that, that the jet action is actually going on. This jet is spewing stuff out that eventually inflates those huge lobes. And what, what we think is going on, but we certainly don't understand all the details yet, is that you've got a very massive black hole, uh, billions of solar masses in this case, and there's an accretion disk of stuff falling into the black hole, but some of the stuff gets squeezed out along the rotation axis of the black hole, and you get these jets, or the rotation axis of the accretion disk, to be more precise. This particular one is the event <coughs> is the one that the Event Horizon Telescope people looked at. We're trying to see the event horizon of these black holes, and this is the closest we've got to it. Um, the even at normal VLBI resolution that is, is much too coarse to see the event horizon of even such a massive black hole. Um, and so the event horizon people did an awful lot of work to try and get a bunch of telescopes working at very high frequencies, 230 gigahertz in this case, to work together, which is technically much harder and got these amazing images that, that a couple of years ago, this was sort of a big deal. And this is the closest we've got to an image. We can now see the shadow of the black hole and they've also got polarization. So the sort of striations on these images are the polarization, which tells you about the magnetic field. This isn't <clears throat> an easy thing, not only because it's technically hard, but because this thing changes all the time. So these are three images and, and the changes between those are real. So you have to contend with an object that is continually changing as well as all the technical difficulties of trying to coordinate telescopes that are thousands of kilometers apart at wavelengths of a millimeter. Um, the, the supermassive black holes have very, I mean, they eject stuff on short time scale, but the larger dynamics, the instabilities in the accretion disk occur on quite long time scales, thousands or millions of years. And of course, we can't wait that long to see what happens as like watch it go from one kind of an active state to an inactive state. But there are objects in our galaxy called microquasars, which is a black hole with a mass of a few times the, so, the, the mass of the sun compared to sort of millions to billions. And they behave very similar, similarly to active galactic nuclei, but because the mass of the black hole is, is so much smaller, they're on much shorter timescales. And this is a movie of the first one of these that was discovered, it's called SS-433. And again, you can see that, that you've got this jet and there's actual blobs moving out at relativistic speeds that, that then go on. You can't see the lobes on this if you inflate lobes. An entirely different thing that was done with VLBI was in 2014, the uh, Neutrino Observatory, Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, observed a neutrino, which they called Big Bird. I don't know if you guys watched Sesame Street. That's Big Bird. And the reason they called it that was this neutrino had an energy of two peta electron volts. And that works out to 3200 erg, which is one gram at 80 centimeters per second. So you've got a neutrino, an almost massless subatomic particle with the energy of a ping pong ball. Um, the, but the thing is that Ice Cube tells you only very approximately which where on the sky this is from. So we didn't know where this incredibly energetic neutrino came from. Now, luckily the Fermi Large Area Telescope, the Gamma Ray te Telescope observes a good part of the sky. And this is that part of the sky. The white circle there is, is where the, what we know about where Big Bird came from. 
And just within that white circle is a blazar that showed up in gamma rays called Parks B1424 minus 4118. Um, sorry about that B at the end. Uh, but even gamma rays only have a resolution of, of sort of arc minutes. And it wasn't until we got to VLBI and the Tanami team has been monitoring VLBI sources in the southern sky. And they discovered that this blazar had a fairly dramatic outburst. Um, the, there's a couple of images in sequence, and you can see the year. Um, this isn't at the same time as the neutrino, but this is getting to be pretty compelling evidence that this very active source is probably where that incredibly energetic neutrino came from. It, apparently, there's still a 5% chance that this is actually a coincidence because as I said, we didn't catch a flare of this object at exactly the same time the neutrino came from. But it's still, it's looking pretty good that this is the source of that very active neutrino. You looked at Mazers last night. Um, this is a movie of Mazers around a star. There's a star called TX Cam, which is a pulsating star, and it has a ring of silicon oxide Mazers around it. And you see outflow from the star's surface. And this was a big VLBI project. It was one of the big, it may have been the biggest at the time. It was done by Phil Diamond and a bunch of people. And again, they took multiple VLBI images and put them together into this movie. And you can see there's very complex motions with things mostly moving outward, but some things actually still moving in. And probably there's the Maser people will probably know more about this than me. I, I don't know if we understand everything that's going on in this movie yet. Um, closer to what I do is, is radio supernovae. So here's a nearby galaxy M82. And the, the red background is a VLA image with sort of arc minute type resolution. This is a large galaxy, extends many arc minutes on the sky. And, and there's a whole bunch of sort of point-like at arc second resolution sources in there. And when we zoomed in on those with VLBI, so here's that source at 10 milli arc second resolution. So zoom in by a factor of, of 60 arc seconds to the arc minute times 1,000 milli arc seconds to the arc second. So zoom in by a factor of about 60,000. And you see this sort of ring shaped thing. And these are a little more distorted. And it turns out that what these are is they're all relatively young supernova remnants. M82 is a starburst galaxy that has a very high rate of star formation. And thus, it's got a lot of supernovae. Supernovae come from massive stars that don't live very long. And here's a movie of a supernova. This is in another nearby galaxy, M80, the neighbor of M82 called M81. And this was a very nice supernova that was bright in the radio. And we've made over 30 images of it and put those together into a movie. And you can actually see the supernova goes off and this shell of material goes flying out at about 20,000 kilometers per second initially. And then sort of we can track it as it keeps expanding. Now here's a, a this is the, the VLBI image of the supernova again, another version of it. But what you observe with an interferometer, and I'm, I'm assuming you've heard this before, is, is you're actually seeing the Fourier transform of the sky brightness. And here's the Fourier transform relationship. So if you know, your supernova looks sort of like this in the Fourier plane, that's what it looks like. So this is what you actually observe. And this sort of mountainous landscape down here is those are the actual observations that went into making this image. So it's always good to keep in mind with the interferometer, you have to think part of the time in the Fourier plane because that's where your observations are, even though you're sort of interested in the sky plane, which is where the science is. Even more dramatic than supernovae are gamma ray bursts. These are bursts of gamma rays that go off about once per day. They have a duration of seconds per hours. And it, it's been established that they're at cosmological distances. So they're very high luminosity. 
we didn't know much more for a long time because the gamma rays only told you it was vaguely in this part of the sky. Um, but then an Italian X-ray satellite that saw a lot of the sky and had much bigger, much better resolution came online and discovered that there was X-ray afterglows. And since then we've seen that the afterglows extend to, to optical and radio. And what we think is happening for the, at least the longer duration ones, is that they're associated with a particular type of supernova. And so you have a massive star, the core collapses into a black hole. And as it does so, it forms this relativistic jet. And for these particular types of, of supernovae, the relativistic jet is strong enough that it can punch out through the, the envelope of the star, which is still there. And if the jet is, is pointing at us, then it's highly Doppler boosted. And then we see this flash of gamma rays. But if the jet is not near the line of sight, then we might be able to see radio emission from it after a year or two. That's kind of an ongoing, we haven't got a smoking gun yet, but that's an ongoing topic of investigation. Um, the, here's some very important VLBI observations of a GRB. This is GRB 030329 by Taylor Peelstrom et al. And they took a couple of, this is the radio afterglow, and this is the April 2003, and this one is a couple of months later in June. And you can see the thing is expanding. Those of you who are really sharp might be going, no, wait a minute, the beam is just much bigger here. We can't tell it's expanding. You've just got worse resolution. But in fact, we can dig out a, a measure of the actual size, and it is really expanding, and there's more than two observations. So. Here's the time, and this is the, the diameter in the image plane, and this is an upper limit. And you can see that it's expanding fairly consistently. And in fact, if you plot the speed of light on this, you can see that it's actually expanding faster than the speed of light. Um, and then it's sort of after 100 days or so, it slows down, and now it's going slower than the speed of light. And that's indeed what you expect when you have a, a source that's almost pointed at you is that you get uh, is that you get super relativistic motion, apparent super relativistic motion uh, or super luminal expansion that it looks like it's going faster than the speed of light, but that's because the light's only catching up with the jet, which is moving towards you. So nothing's actually physically moving faster, but this is an important confirmation of, of that, well, yes, these are really, they are really involving something that's moving at relativistic velocities. Um, you get very high resolution, but you also get very high positional accuracy. So here's, a, once again, a basic diagram of an interferometer, and you've got your signal coming in and hits the two telescopes, and the delay between the time it hits this telescope and this telescope is just given by this distance here, which depends on this angle. If the angle is zero, then the signal hits both, the delay is zero. So if you can measure the delay, then you can determine that angle. And that's basically what interferometry is doing, is we're measuring this delay, and that tells us where the emission is coming from. And it turns out with VLBI, we can measure these angles more precisely than pretty much any other way to milli arc second precision. And that allows us to do things like this. This is the maser disk of a nearby galaxy. I've, I've mentioned the supermassive black holes in the centers of some galaxies. This is another one that has one. And the thing is, we don't know how massive those things are. It's very hard to measure the mass of things. You can't go out and pop it on a scale and go, oh yeah, 4.73 times 10 to the 9 solar masses. Um, but obviously, we'd like to know and in this galaxy, we had the fortuitous circumstance that, that there was a disk of masers around the center of the galaxy. So you've got these spots that are both very bright. These are mega masers. Probably you're looking at galactic ones. These are much brighter. Um, these spots that are very compact, so you can resolve, you can see them with VLBI and measure their position very accurately. 
And of course, they're, because they're masers, you can measure the wavelength very accurately. And so it turns out you can get three-dimensional information as to how they're moving. And then you can solve this disk, this Keplerian orbits, and solve for the mass in the center. And in, it's, this is a relatively direct, this is sort of basic physics once you've got the motions. Um, so you get both the distance and the mass of the black hole. In this case, it's 3.9, 39 million solar masses. And this was, this was one of the few cases where you have a fairly direct measure of the mass of the black hole. And that's because we could use VLBI to, to measure these. There's no other way to measure the, the motions of these things. They're sort of milliarc seconds. The parallax is the, the apparent shift of objects on the sky because the Earth is going around the sun. So if you've got some object that's not that far away, so here's a quasar, this is like far away at redshift equals one or whatever. And, and the, it's <clears throat> the, the lines of sight are all, are all in the same direction. It doesn't matter where on Earth's orbit we are, but here we have a closer object and it's a little off to the side. And then you wait four months. Meanwhile, the Earth has moved here. You can see this is now to, the line of sight to this object is now at a different angle than the lines of sight to your reference source. And you, know, you wait another six months and it's over here. So if you watch this thing, you should see it wandering back and forth on the sky with respect to your reference object. And what that does is we know this side of the triangle. If we can measure this angle, then we can determine this side of the triangle, which is the distance. And distances are very hard to determine directly in astronomy. So people are excited about this. And because VLBI can measure small angles, we can measure distances by this way out to a few kiloparsecs. Not that far in the galaxy, but still better than any other way of directly measuring distance. And here's an application of that. This is the Pulsar B950 plus 08. Um, and Walter Briskin and people did careful observations of this. And this is the position of it on the sky. This is the relative right ascension, the relative declination. And you can see that, that it, it doesn't just go back and forth like you expect from parallax because it's also moving that it starts off down here in 1998 and it's up here at 2000 because pulsars generally have a high space motion. So this is just moving across the sky in some relatively constant way, but then it also has this parallax and the, the curve there is the fit. Um, and you get a very accurate distance out of the parallax turns out to be 3.82 plus or minus 0 0.07 milliarc seconds. So that's the, the extent of this back and forth wiggle. And the distance is just one over the parallax or the distance parsec, sorry, is one over the parallax. And that turns out to be 261 parsecs. Uh, which I think was around twice what people had believed this pulsar or half. It was like way off from what people had believed this pulsar was. But this is a very direct, it's just geometry. So if you're measuring the angle correctly, there's nothing really you can do wrong. Here's another parallax measurement. This is the distance measurement to the Pleiades. The Pleiades are a group of nearby stars. And Hipparchos was a satellite that that was put up and its business was to measure parallaxes to stars. And it did that very well, but it got a somewhat discrepant distance to the Pleiades. Um, the, the white error bars here are all the other means of more approximate means of determining the distance. And here's what Hipparchus got. And this was sort of this controversy for a while that Hipparchus was the most direct way of measuring the distances. And it was discrepant by sort of whatever this is, 20%. Um, and the Melis et al. did VLBI observations. The stars are quite faint, so they needed a very sensitive VLBI array with all the biggest radio telescopes, the Green Bank Telescope, Arecibo. This wouldn't be possible anymore today because Arecibo is gone, and Effelsberg. And they got this distance here. So not only did they have the smallest error bars, it's kind of consistent with all the other distances. Um, 
since then, we've got the Gaia satellite, which is a new satellite that, that is measuring parallaxes of billions of stars. And it's, it's got this measurement. I think probably the Gaia measurement will get better with future Gaia data releases. Um, but anyways, the distance controversy seems to be largely settled. And so far, the VLBI is still the most accurate measure of the distance to this star cluster. And this is sort of important because a lot of our distances are built up on measuring distance to relatively close by objects like, like the Pleiades. And then we sort of extrapolate from that. So if we're getting the distance to nearby objects wrong, then the scale of the universe as we know it changes because a lot of the other distances are based on that. So, so we want to get the distances to nearby things right. Uh, here's another outburst type thing. Um, this one's a nova. So it's a binary system where one star is dumping mass on the other, and then you get a thermonuclear runaway. And it, you get sort of an explosion, not as big as a supernova explosion that, that disrupts the whole star. And these are the VLBI images that uh, that Chomiak had, had all made. And the, the gray contours are the ones on day 91. And then they observed it again, sort of 20 days later. And they got the colored thing. And you can see that the colored blobs are clearly outside of the gray contours. So this thing is moved. It's ejected two blobs that are moving out. And you can measure the speed um, here's another one I was involved with. This is a this is a star. Most stars aren't very radio bright, and the the brighter ones tend to be very active stars because it's not the the surface of the star, rather the chromosphere where the radio emission arises, and it arises in loops, sort of coming off the star like the solar flares. And we observed this star called I am Pegasi with a lot of VLBI sessions that we were actually observing it as a reference point for a, a gravity probe B experiment, which is a whole other story. But we had all these observations of, of the star. And we put them together into a movie. And we got this movie. And the white circle there is, is our best estimate of where the center of the star is. These are sort of lined up by the star. And you can see that the radio emission jumps around all over the place and that's because the radio emission isn't coming from the surface of the star but rather from these sort of plumes and things that shoot off of the outside of the star to do all this astronometry you need reference sources you need to have some kind of frame to positional reference frame and our best positional reference frame is the international celestial reference frame or the icrf the current implementation of that is the ICRF3, which is adopted in 2019. And we've got 4,000, 4,500 some extragalactic sources. Almost all of them are active galactic nuclei that, that make up this positional reference frame. And, and these positions have been measured very exact, very accurately. And this is what we kind of tie position measurements to. The, ICRF is, is also tied to the International Terrestrial Reference Frame, which is a reference frame for positions on the surface of the Earth. And you can actually turn VLBI around. If, if you know the distance between your telescopes, you can tell something about your source on the sky. But if you know the source on the sky, for example, if you're using one of those ICRF sources, if you know exactly where the source is on the sky, then you can turn it around and measure the distance between your telescopes to sort of centimeter or even millimeter precision. And that's what geodesy does. They routinely observe a bunch of sources of known position and they solve for the distances between the telescopes. And that way you can directly measure. So here's a, a baseline from Wetzel, Germany to Westford, Massachusetts. And the time here goes from 1984 to 1990. And the length of the baseline, there's, there's some noise. It gets better as time goes on because we got better receivers or <laughs> um, switch to wider bandwidth. Or, um, but you can see the length of the, this is the 
vertical scale is the length of the baseline and there's 10, 10 centimeters that, that this baseline is steadily growing. So that cell Germany is moving away from Westford, Massachusetts at a few centimeters per year. And the people do this with telescopes all over the world to, to directly measure the motions of the Earth's plates. I will, I'll stop here for a minute. And if anyone has any questions on this part of the talk, let me know. And I'll do what I can to answer them. No questions? Everyone understood that perfectly? No, there's a question. Sorry? There's a question. Okay. Yes. So my question is on uh, international celestial uh, reference frame. Yep. Yes, uh, I want to ask a question about uh, ICRF. Okay. Yes, uh, there's one of the slides I've seen you are, uh, this frame is based on uh, some coordinates. I don't know whether you can go back to that slide. Yeah, it was it this slide? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, it's based on uh, coordinates of uh, 45, 36. So uh, can you please uh, kindly explain to me this? Uh, this seems to be a reference a coordinate. Um, yeah, it, it's what they do is, is it's, it's a somewhat complicated problem because what, what they, they measure the delay, they do VOBI observations of these sources and what that measures is the delay between b between the time when the signal hits the telescope in, let's say, <laughs> Wetzel, Germany, and the time it hits the one in in Westford, Massachusetts. So that's the basic observable is these delays for sources, sort of, and they observe sources all over the sky, and then you can solve for for. If you have enough sources, you can solve for both the positions of the telescopes, which you don't know that accurately, um, and the relative positions of all these sources. So that's what they do is, is they, they observe a lot of sources and they put that together and come up with a solution that, that, that produces those delays that, that tells them first the distance and the orientation between for any baseline, which is always which is a function of time, and the exact position of the source, and that's that's how this is built up. So you get they they, they observe they observe I don't know several times a year that I let Devitt at Hartrow at all is busy doing this. This is a big operation that that people have been observing for decades these sources so that we get these very very accurate positions and then most of most of the rest of the time the astronomers when they do VLBI usually what you do is you pick one of these sources that's nearby the source you're interested so you know supernova 1993j let's say might have been who knows here and so we pick this source and we observe that and then we do the relative i'll say a little bit but more in the next part but we do the we get the relative position and the the quasars are all very far away so they're for most practical purposes they can be assumed to be fixed they can't be moving in angle because they're so far away um and that that the the celestial reference frame is is well it's it's a realization of the coordinates the sort of abstract coordinate system but we've got these sources that this these are sort of the handles on our coordinate system these are the markers if you will that that you know a coordinate system on the earth isn't all that much use unless you have some markers going okay this is the greenwich meridian and there's you know some stone plaque on the ground and these are kind of like the markers in the sky that, that mark 
that, that we use to mark the celestial reference position. Did that answer the question or? Yes. Uh, then uh, maybe just to know, uh, before we adopted this uh, ICRF uh, in 2019, what were we using for as a frame in uh, astrometry? Uh, before that, we were using ICRF2 and before that, ICRF1. Um, there's also an optical reference frame based on stars that I forgot what it's called. Um, it's, it's less, the VLBI one is considerably more accurate. Um, although that Gaia is now getting very accurate optical positions. So there's now some competition as to how we can get the most accurate positions. But I think for, for the time being, the, the, the VLBI is the most accurate one still. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other question? Oh, There's yep. What, one more question. Yep. <laughs> Hello, Michael. Hello, Michael. Hello, Michael, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Yeah, I have two questions. Sorry? Yeah, I have two questions. Yep. The VLBI has been able to do amazing science over the time. So aside being able to understand uh, our universe, what are some of the science questions that the VLBI seeks to answer? Um, well, I, I I just went through a bunch of those that that you know we can we can resolve things that that we can see what the shadow of a black hole looks like, for example, and then we can you know go do our relativistic math and think, do we understand how this system works? We can measure positions very accurately. One of the basic things with with parallax is measure distances that that is generally fairly hard in astronomy. Um, so, so we can measure the distances to things and that affects how we understand them because you know lots of things scale with distance squared. If you think your object has this brightness, but you got the distance wrong by a factor of two, then its luminosity is wrong by a factor of four. So if you wanna try and understand things, you you often want to know the distance, um, and and to get motions. So so said so whatever. It's kind of whatever science questions you want to <clears throat> that you want to answer. That you know if you need the distance or the motion or the size of something, then you often have to turn to astronomy uh, to VLBI because as I said many astronomical units many astronomical sources are are very small in angle so the only way to measure kind of a size directly is vlbi that i said our star would be about our sun would be about half a milliarc second um and typical nearby stars are sort of milliarc seconds or less so the only way we can measure their diameters directly is vlbi i mean even that doesn't work that well because most of the nearby stars are not very radio bright, but the, the, it's sort of the only way of telling, for example, that, that stars aren't cubes. For, for all we know from even Hubble Space Telescope observations, all the stars could be cubes. We'd have to rewrite a lot of physics for that to work, but there's no observational evidence. Um, and that you can only get from something like VLBI where you might actually resolve the star and go, okay, it's looking it's looking like a sphere or well at least like a circle in projection since it's only two dimensional okay uh just out of curiosity uh looking at vlbi you're able to uh, do amazing science because uh we're able to cover a large distance based on the distance between the various uh telescopes so i want to know if uh looking at the size of the earth and then uh, places that are available to for telescopes to be placed, would it be possible to map out our entire universe? 
Sorry, would it be possible to map out? Our entire universe, the entire universe. Um, well, the, the, what VLBI gets you is not necessarily the, the distance that um, anything you're, if you tune a TV set to an empty channel, part of the noise you're seeing is the microwave background. So even a ordinary TV set can see to the edge of the observable universe. Um, so seeing distances in this hard, as long as the thing you're looking at is bright enough, um, what, what VLBI buys you is, is resolution that, that you can see, you can see very small things the, your TV set doesn't tell you where the microwave background is coming from. Whereas VLBI can tell you at milli arc second precision, that radiation is coming from this part of the sky, not that part of the sky. Um, and the, the, as it turns out, one of the advantages of radio is, is that the, the universe is generally fairly transparent to radio. Um, so we can probably see more of it. For example, the, the Event Horizon Telescope people are also looking at, at the massive black hole in the center of our galaxy, which is called Sagittarius A star. And, and we can't see it optically because we're looking through the whole galactic plane and there's all this gas and dust in the way. And, and so we, we can't really see Sag A star optically at all, but all that stuff is transparent to radio. So, so one of the advantages of radio is that, that you can see through dust obscures a lot of optical emission, um, like the galaxy M82 that had a starburst. Uh, again, a bunch of those sources aren't visible in the optical because they're shrouded by a bunch of dust, but, but radio waves don't care about dust because the size of the dust grains is much smaller than the wavelength. So, so radio allows you to see through a lot of dust. So that's one of its advantages. It, the, the resolution is in fact lower because you need a much larger telescope to get the same resolution. Um, the advantage of radio is that it's much easier to do interferometry over a couple of thousand kilometers. In principle, you could do this with optical and you'd get sort of, you know, whatever it is, femto arc second resolution, like much, much better. But that that's, but then you'd need to know the distances to your telescope, between your telescopes to a few angstroms. Um, and that's, we're not there yet. Like we can, we've, we've got to the point where we can measure the distance between, between Germany and Massachusetts, USA to a few millimeters. Uh, we're, I think, some ways away from measuring that distance to a few angstroms. So it's sort of for technical reasons that, that VLBI is, is possible in the radio, but not yet possible in the optical or let alone, I mean, in principle, you could do this in x-ray and get even better resolution. But the, the getting things, <clears throat> getting your systems to be stable and lined up at the kind of time and, and space accuracy, is is at present only really possible for VLBI, so that's why VLBI has the best resolution. Even though the, you'd expect, sort of all else being equal, the resolution would be better at, at the much shorter wavelengths of, of optical, or so let alone X-ray. Um, so I think the sort of to answer to come back to your question is that that I mean yes, VLBI can see much of much of the universe probably about as much as anything can um so if if depending at what level of detail the the vlbi sky <clears throat> like at milli arc second scales there's an awful lot of sky so you know if you really want to measure the whole like if you wanted to make a whole sky map at milli arc and second scales that that would be a stupendously large problem because there's so many square milli arc seconds I mean, there are a lot of square degrees in the sky. Um, so I think it's, it's certainly some ways off that we have a milli arc second sky survey where we've just observed the whole of the observable universe. 
I think the LBI is still and will be for some time much more targeted that, okay, we pick this source and observe it and we only observe a very small part of the sky. But in principle, there's nothing sort of stopping you from doing that. Has that answered the question? Yes, please. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Sorry, I didn't catch that. Should I go on or are there more questions? I have a question. Yep. I'm having a question on, on behalf of Kenyan students. Okay. Yeah. How do you combine GPS and VLBI? Um, the, well, the, what GPS, they both measure positions on the earth. Um, so you could, instead of doing VLBI to measure how, how Germany and the USA are moving apart, you could do it with GPS receivers. And in fact, people do, um, the advantage of VLBI is that it's tied, it ties the celestial and the terrestrial reference frames together, whereas the GPS system can rotate because you don't know that it's, it's based on a bunch of satellites rotating the earth. So there's basically kind of a rotational degree of freedom that VLBI doesn't have. Um, and I'm not sure I th <clears throat> the VLBI I think is more accurate, although as we're getting more and more GPS receivers, that that may be changing and and so the probably, you know, for the most accurate system, you kind of want to do both. I'm not up on how those are technically combined. Um but they're sort of two different ways of, of measuring positions on the earth that I don't know if GPS has any direct application to measuring positions on the sky. It's, so I mean, you're measuring positions relative to this constellation of satellites, basically. Okay, should I go on? Yeah. So we've talked about some of the science we can do with VLBI. So how do we do it? Um, so here is this picture again, and we've got the telescopes that aren't physically connected. And the challenges are that we need very accurate timekeeping and very accurate determination of the distances between the telescopes. Um, and a, probably the biggest sort of problem that we have is that, that our signals are not just coming through a vacuum, they're also coming through the atmosphere. And your signal doesn't travel, the, the radiation moves at the speed of light in a vacuum, but not in the atmosphere, it moves a little less than that. And so, because the different telescopes have different, you know, in this particular picture, um, this one has a shorter path through the atmosphere than this one, because this one's sort of observing lower to the horizon. So you get a delay because of the different path lengths through the atmosphere. The atmosphere is also not all that stable. Um, so you get this delay that comes from the atmosphere. And of course, with VLBI, we're interested in this delay, but we want just the geometrical part. So we want to calibrate out any part that comes from the atmosphere. Um, and we also said we need to know where the telescopes are. We need the, the earth is rotating. So where the telescopes are is kind of a time dependent three dimensional problem. And then you actually have to get the data from the telescope to the correlator. Um, sometimes this can be done over the internet. Um, each it's a fair bit of data sort of typically stations produce around a gigabit per second and we'd love to do more because that's the higher 
we get better signal to noise if we use higher bandwidth, um, but that means that the data rate goes up. So you have to get all this data so that either you have to have a give gigabit per second internet connection to wherever the correlator is for the EVN correlator in, in <coughs> the Netherlands does a lot of the, well, the European VLBI network stuff. Um, so you have to ship your data to Holland and either you can sort of write it on disk packs and then call FedEx and ship the disk packs there or if you have an internet connection that can do that. Um, we'll skip that one. Uh, so you've got this, this VLBI array, the data gets shipped, it gets correlated. And so what, what is the actual data product that comes out of the correlator? And basically what it is, is a very long list of complex numbers. The correlator takes the signal from antenna one and antenna two and correlates them up for an integration time, typically a few seconds. And you get a, as it turns out, it's a complex correlation coefficient out of that. It's not just a scalar. So you get one complex number out of that. And you wind up with a very large number of these complex numbers. The complex numbers are called the visibility measurements. So if you take, for example, the very long baseline array in the USA, it has 10 antennas. So at each particular time stamp, time stamp you've got 45 baselines. The number of baselines is n times n minus 1 over 2. And if you count the autocorrelations, then there's 10 more. So, so you've got something like n squared um, over 2 baselines. And then we usually have frequency resolution. So for the, the LBA, typically, you might have eight spectral windows. So you break up your bandwidth into eight sort of larger chunks um, called spectral windows, or they, they used to be called IFs for intermediate frequencies um, because the, they, were, they were the actual sort of intermediate frequencies used by the electronics. And then each spectral window can be broken up into tens or hundreds of channels. So you can have thousands of channels of frequency resolution. Um, and then for each channel and for each baseline, you can have up to four complex correlations that most VLBI is done in circular polarization. So the telescopes have a right circular and a left circular polarization receiver. When you correlate them, there's four combinations. You can correlate right with right, left with left, right with left, left with right. Um, the parallel hand, the right right and the left left tell you about the total emission and the cross ones tell you about the polarized emission. So if you do all four, so that's another four. And then there's sort of ancillary information that goes with those. With each of these correlations, you get a weight, call it how good it is. And then you have the meta information. You need the coordinates of the source. Uh, you know, which, what's, which source are you observing? What's the frequency? What's the time? And so forth. And you put all that together and you get, oops, the number of times times the number of baselines times the number of spectral windows times the number of channels times the number of correlations. And typically that works out to around 10 to the eighth visibilities per hour. So we're talking 10 to a hundreds tens to hundreds of gigabytes per observation. So even after before correlation, you've got a gigabyte per second from each telescope and it's better after correl correlation reduces that data volume, but it's still a lot of data. The LBI is, is, has <clears throat> less of this problem than do connected elements. The connected inter element interferometers, because they tend to have more baselines. The VLA has 27 antennas, which means there's 351 baselines, as opposed to the sort of order 100 that you get with, with most VLBI arrays. Meerkat has 64 baselines, sorry, 64 antennas. That's 2,000 baselines. So because the number of baselines goes up at a, as n squared, it goes up very rapidly. The, the theory of the visibility measurement, I, I think you've probably seen this before, but what the interferometer measures, this visibility measurement, is the Fourier transform of the sky brightness. So this is the visibility measurement. And it's of these UV, the, the 
Fourier transform coordinates. And it's just the integral of the sky of the sky brightness as a function of the two sky coordinates, say right ascension declination. And then this sort of e to the i factor, and this is a Fourier transform. Now, the thing we measure is this, the thing we're interested in is i. So what we wanna do is turn this around. And it turns out that the inverse Fourier transform looks almost exactly the same as the Fourier transform. The only thing that changes is this is a minus sign here. So the sky brightness that we're interested in is the Fourier transform of these visibilities. And that's that's what I showed you in that picture of supernova 1993J with, with the kind of weird mountainous blue landscape. Um, so these vis visibilities describe the amplitude and the phase of sine waves in the image plane. And if you add up all these sine waves, then you get your image. And in very sort of general terms, the amplitude of the visibility tells, tells you sort of how concentrated the emission is in the image plane. And the phase tells you where it is. Is it at the center of the image plane? Is it off at the side? Now, in reality, in it, in a perfect world, you'd get these visibility measurements out of your correlator, you'd run them through your Fourier transform machine, and there would be your picture of the sky. Uh, in reality, it doesn't work quite that well because you've got all these things to contend with. You've got weather, like I said, that you actually have to compensate for the delay going through the atmosphere because that doesn't tell you anything about where your source is on the sky. That just tells you how cloudy it is. They are clocks. We use hydrogen masers, and they're the best clocks we have. But in VLBI terms, they're not perfect. So the clocks can drift. The electronics don't behave like ideal electronics would. Your bandpass might be not square or have humps or ripples in it. The antennas don't behave perfectly either. There's part of them's obstructed by the feed legs and shape isn't perfect, the gain changes with elevation, and there's interference, the, there's radio signals that aren't coming from the sky that creep into your system and mess it up. So we have to deal with all these things to try and get back to what is on the sky. Uh, radio frequency interference is, is kind of a big problem. It's actually more of a problem for connected element interferometers. With VLBI, you have the advantage that, that most of the sources of interference are relatively local. So at least it's only affecting one telescope. So it doesn't correlate. But here is a chunk of the L-band spectrum from the VLA. Um, so from 1200 to about 1800 megahertz. And all these lines here, they're all labeled, although it takes people with younger eyes than mine to actually read those labels. Um, but But all these lines that show up are some kind of satellite or radar that's generating a signal that we don't want. So we have to identify these interfering signals and, and try and remove them I, if we can suppress them. But often you don't have that choice that you can't shoot Jeff Bezos's constellation of satellites out of the sky just because you want to do radio astronomy. So though the telescopes are, are the, and the arrays are designed as well as we can, they're not perfect. And, and we have to be cognizant and calibrate so that, that we take count into what our real telescope is doing compared to what an ideal telescope would do. The, we need to know where the telescopes are at each moment in time to do VLBI. And so we need the positions of the telescopes on the surface of the Earth. We need how the Earth is turning. The Earth doesn't turn completely steadily. Um, the model we have of these things is, is good, but not perfect. So we could be getting the positions of our antennas slightly wrong. Um, the, the source positions, we also don't necessarily know where those are exactly. Um, in fact, if you're doing astrometry, that's exactly what you're trying to figure out. Um, and the, the biggest ones are probably the, the atmosphere and the ionosphere, which are time variable and unpredictable. Um, the, and 
as I've already mentioned, radio frequency interference. Um, and the clocks, <clears throat> the, the clocks tend to drift relatively slowly. So calibrating out the clocks is, is easier. As I said, usually the biggest practical problem is calibrating out the atmosphere because it's, it's rapidly variable in time because it depends on the weather. Now, in principle, you would just do absolute calibration. You go measure, OK, if there is this much signal outside of the atmosphere in whatever units you want to ergs per centimeter squared per second per hertz, um, what comes out the back of my telescope or what comes out of my coral, like what correlation coefficient does that give me? Um, and, and the same as if my source is exactly here, what is the phase that I see on this baseline? That kind of absolute calibration turns out to be very hard. And in practice, almost all VLBI uses cross calibration because it's much easier. So what you do is you observe a song strong source. And I showed you this picture of the ICRF sources that's nearby. Um, and then you do everything relative to that ICRF source. And that's the way that you mostly calibrate out the atmosphere is that the ICRF source, you know what it is. Sorry, you know where it is. So you, and along with your model of where the telescopes are, you can calculate what the delays should be. And so any difference with the observed delays to what they should be, you attribute to the atmosphere and go, okay, this is the delay through the atmosphere to the direction of the ICRF source. And then you hope that the delay through the atmosphere is at least fairly similar to your target source, which is just next to it. So basically that's almost always what one does is you observe calibrator sources and then you do everything relative to those calibrators. And in the Fourier transform plane, if you've got your calibrator source in the center of the field, and the calibrator source is unresolved, then things are easy because then the amplitude is constant. Doesn't matter how long your baseline is and the phase is zero. Uh, that turns out to be not quite as easy in VLBI because especially at shorter wavelengths, there's almost nothing that really looks like a point source anymore. Um, pulsars probably look at points, look. Pulsars are very small. They're only sort of tens of kilometers. So they might be one of the few things that really looks like an uh, unresolved source. But for other things, you often have to take into account that, that your source is at least somewhat resolved. Uh, you can't observe, well, if you have enough telescopes, you can in principle observe both your target and your calibrator at the same time, but usually what you do is you observe one and then the other and nod back and forth. And the, the time scale for which you want to do that depends on the frequency. Typically, it's sort of minutes. Um, it's longer at low frequencies. At higher frequencies, like the Event Horizon Telescope, you'd have to nod back and forth sort of every couple of seconds, which is no longer physically possible. So that's one of their problems is, is that they can't do the way that we do this at centimeter wave. So the practical calibration considerations is what you get from, you get sort of a priori, you get these things from the observatory or from the <laughs> correlator, um, the antenna positions, the earth orientation and, and the rate and the clocks and the frequency reference and antenna pointing and focus and gain curve. Most antennas have a slightly different gain when they're pointing straight up to when they're pointing down to the horizon. So to calibrate the amplitudes, you have to take into account what elevation you're observing at. And the calibrator coordinates and the, their flux densities. If you're doing polarization, you need to know about the calibrator polarization properties. What's the polarization angle? How polarized is it? And as I said, in principle, one could do this the absolute engineering calibration, just go measure it in dBm and Kelvin and volts. but that turns out to be very, very difficult. So people have done a little bit of that. Um, but then you, once you've done that once, you sort of do everything else relatively. Um, so you wind up with a calibration that, that is antenna-based. The measured visibilities come from the product of, or the correlation of two 
antenna-based signals. So if you have n antennas, um, say the VLBA has 10 of them, then so you've got this n baseline, roughly n squared over 2, number of baselines. So for each baseline, you want some calibration factor, a complex calibration factor that's the g of ij, the gain of ij, that's some you know amplitude and phase. So you have the same number as you do baselines. In the case of the VLBA, that's 45 of these things that you want to determine. However, if these calibration factors can be, <clears throat> sorry, there are a lot of factors here. If you can factor these, these gains into telescope dependent terms, so that GIJ is GI times GJ, then you only have N such factors. So we're down from 45 to 10. And that gets better as n gets large. So you want to factor out everything in an antenna-based way, if at all possible, because you have sort of order n squared baselines you want to calibrate, but you've only got order n telescopes. Um, and luckily, most effects are antenna-dependent and do, in fact, factor out this way. For example, the delay through the atmosphere is one of the most difficult things to calibrate out. but it doesn't depend on which, teles which other telescope you're cor correlating this to. It's just the time delay takes the signal to go through the atmosphere or on its way from the distant quasar to the telescope in, say, Germany. So, so the delay through the atmosphere is, is antenna-based, so it factors in this way. So that's most calibration tries to identify these antenna-based factors. And in fact, often what you do is you assume that anything that, that does factor out in an antenna-based way is, is calibration because your source doesn't know where your antennas are. So there's no reason why this, the source should affect all the baselines to Effelsberg in the same way. So if the amplitude on all the baselines to Effelsberg goes up, then it's pretty reason at the same time, it's a pretty reasonable assumption that what happened is that the gain of Effelsberg just went up for whatever reason that you know the cooling kicked in or and here's just a picture to show this. This is a couple of VLA antennas. And so here you've got phase, and on the horizontal axis you've got time, and these are all different baselines, and, and you can see they all have antenna 17 or EA 17 is the second. And you see the pattern is very similar to all of them. And that's showing you exactly the, 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 the part of this that's similar is, is almost certainly, the, in this case, it's probably the, mostly the delay to antenna 17. Probably antenna 17 is one out at the end of the arm that, that is seeing through an atmosphere that's more different. And here's the second version of the same thing. So this is, we see these and, and you can sort of see by looking at this, that the pattern is almost the same. So, so we just need one of these patterns for each antenna, not one for every baseline. Um, you'll hear about what's called closure. And before people got good at, at developing the baseline, the antenna-based calibration, they figured out that there was a thing called closure phase. And if you have three baselines on, so you've got three different telescopes and there's three possible baselines there. And, and on each baseline, you observe a phase on the, the like the, cor the phase of the correlation coefficient. Um, now that's the observed phase and each observed phase is corrupted. So, for the first baseline, you've got the true phase that your perfect interferometer sitting out in space would observe, and then plus a phase change due to antenna one, or antenna I in this case, minus the phase change due to antenna J. Um, whatever those are, they could those phase changes could be due to the atmosphere, could be due to the electronics. And the same is for these other two baselines. And if you actually work this out, you notice that all these phase changes that, that you're, <clears throat> you don't know because they're due to the atmosphere or to unknown properties of electronics actually cancel out so that the, this 
product of, uh, sorry, the sum of the phases around a triangle of baselines, the observed one is the same as the true one, regardless of, you don't need to worry about the calibration. So this is a great thing because these theta ij's are, are not, they're hard to determine. And in fact, the Event Horizon Telescope, they, they pretty much, that's all they do is they work with these closure phases. The problem with the closure phases is that they're not very easy to interpret. It's this weird quantity of phase in the Fourier transform plane around a triangle that if you've just got phase of some point in the Fourier transform plane, then you can Fourier transform that plane and get the image. Uh, if you're only working with the closure phases, it's much harder to interpret, but that you have this advantage that, that you're independent of any antenna based things that, that sit between you. You can form a similar sort of thing with the amplitudes. I won't go through this one in detail. You need four baselines to form a closure amplitude, um, but it's, it's the same kind of deal that all the calibration factors sort of drop out and this ratio of observed, or sorry, this ratio of observed amplitudes is actually equal to the ratio of the true ones. Now here's an example of closure phase. This is time here and phase, and this is very high frequency, 680 gigahertz. And in color, you have three different baselines, well, four or five, four or six and five, six between three antennas. Um, and you can see that, that the phase wanders all over the place and is quite noisy on each baseline. But if you form this closure triangle and you just add all these three phases together, then you get this black line that's almost constant. And that's what, if, if you have an unresolved source, then the baseline phases, you ex an unresolved source at sort of the center of your pointing, then the phases on each baseline are, are zero. And so the closure phases also have to be zero because zero plus zero plus zero equals zero. So you can see this works really nicely that, that if you're just looking at the colored points, it'd be really hard to say what's going on with this source. And without doing this very time dependent calibration, you can form the closure tell and that tells you that it doesn't tell you there's a point source, but it tells you it's consistent with being an unresolved source. Um, so we have to do fringe fitting is, is the, basically the raw correlator output. You've got these phase, I've been talking about calibration factors that, that the, the theta ij from a couple of slides ago. Um, but of course, all these things are time dependent, especially the bit that is due to the atmosphere. Um, so with VLBI, you typically need to solve not only for the phase shift for some antenna, uh, but also you want the derivative of that phase shift as a function of time because it's changing all the time that, that you know, as the source tracks across the sky, just the path length through the atmosphere changes just because of the geometry but will also change because the, the weather or whatever. Um, and it turns out that you also need the derivative in terms of frequency because the phase change isn't going to be the same at one end of your band at the other. And so here's some, this is a picture of raw correlator output phases. So these are the ones that come straight from the correlator and, and somewhat stable, but then, you know, here it starts winding rapidly and then it slows down again. And here's a different baseline and there's a third baseline. And here's the phase as a function of frequency. So you're going the, on the bottom here on the horizontal axis, you've got the channel and the, well, we'll mostly look at this part. This is the phase and you, you can see in frequency, it's fairly within, <clears throat> the two bigger divisions here are the two SBWs or IFs. And within each IF, it's a fairly constant slope. But we need to calibrate, if, if we're looking at a calibrator here, then the true phases should, all these true phases should be zero. Um, so we need to calibrate out all these slopes that we see in these two graphs. 
to make <clears throat> before we can get something sensible out of our, our, the observation of the target source. Um, and fringe fitting is basically called the process of is you look at the calibrator and you find these phases, like both the, the phases function of time, including the slopes, so that you can interpolate between these bits um, to where you've got your observations of the program source. And again, the slopes in terms of frequencies. And the reason we need to do that again is, is the, the model of the correlator that sort of says where the antennas are is, is good, but not perfect. That we could have the position of the telescope a little wrong. Um, we could have the position of the source wrong. And the, the biggest part of it is that the atmosphere and the ionosphere are both time variable and quite unpredictable. And the, the clocks also have some drift. So you have to, all of those contribute to these slopes of, of the, the observed visibility phase with time and frequency that you need to calibrate out. Now here's sort of an example graphically. This is actually with a space radio telescope. Uh, I was saying earlier that the resolution depends on the length of your baseline divided by the wavelength. And the, there's sort of a limit to somewhere of somewhere around 12,000 kilometers as to how far away you can make two telescopes on Earth. And if you want even better resolution, you can either go to higher frequency or you can move the telescopes even farther away. And once they're off the Earth, you have to put them on the satellite. And there has been such a VLBI satellite, it's no longer operational. And these are the fringes. So on one side, you've got the fringe the, the fringe delay. So this is the slope of observed phase versus frequency and or raw phase is labeled here. And then the other high, there's the fringe rate. This is the slope with time. And if you add up the signals, if you sort of integrate across this, there'll be one particular rate and delay. It's when you've got this, when you've got the right slope here that flattens out this, where excuse me, where the signal sort of adds up coherently. And so that's when you see the signal. So basically the, the way of doing this is, is sort of a brute force that you take your observed signals and you add them up across the band. If you add up these signals across the band, then the amplitude will be low because the phase changes by sort of in this case by almost a whole circle um, so you're averaging a vector that goes around in a circle and you get very low amplitude. Um, so it's only when you straighten out this phase and get the delay that the averaging across the band starts adding up coherently and the same happens in time. So here, so that one particular delay, so slope in frequency and rate, slope in time, that's where the signal pops up. And this happens to be from this particular quasar. But that's what you do. You look at your calibrator sources and, and you sort of find the, the slopes and delay in time that maximize the signal. And that's what's called the fringe rate and the fringe delay. Um, the delay model that, that goes into the calibrator is, is quite complex. So here's some values. And for an 8,000, <clears> kilometer baseline, one milliarc second corresponds on the ground to about 3.9 centimeters. So it's about one wavelength at a typical frequency of eight gigahertz or 130 picoseconds. And the zero order geometry, just where are your dishes on the earth? That, that, that makes about a 6,000 kilometer difference and changes on a time scale of one day. That we know fairly well. Now the earth is spinning around its axis, but it's also wobbling um with a small scale that's mutation time scale about 18 years <clears throat> and then there's precession that the whole axis sort of processes around with the time well the time scale for the whole precession is is 27,000 years i think 26,000 anyway tens of thousands of years but that makes sort of arc minutes per year kind of kind of difference uh there's some relativistic effect. There's the annual aberration from the Earth moving around the sun and the relativistic effects, gravitational delay, 
Then there's the motion of the tectonic plates that moves your telescopes around by 10 centimeters per year. The solid earth tide, the earth, the surface of the earth actually moves up and down depending on where the moon is by 50 centimeters. Um, I'm not even sure what the pole tide is. Ocean loading that, that the, if, if, the, if all the water is because of the tides flowing towards your coastline, then it, it causes the surface of the earth to go down by a couple of centimeters. The atmospheric loading also causes the surface of the earth to move up and down by centimeters. Um, and so forth, the, you'll notice that these things are all sort of fairly small. This is the rate of the Earth's rotation, which isn't quite constant. Um, but then the big ones are the atmosphere. The troposphere at zenith can be can correspond to 2.3 meter path length difference. So that's pretty big, especially if you're working at wavelengths of centimeters. Um, and it's variable on hours to day time scales that wet troposphere, and this is at zenith, so if you're looking down near the horizon, it can be many times worse than this. And the wet troposphere isn't quite as bad, but it's also very time variable. Um, so these are probably the ones that are the hardest to calibrate. But so do you want to try and calibrate all these things out because they all contribute to, to basically changes in the delay from the one that you observe to the one that you're interested in which was the one from of the signals hitting one antenna and then the other. Um, I probably I will skip over this. To, that that's mostly about calibrating the phases. We also have to calibrate the amplitudes. Um, yeah, um, just to interrupt. Sorry, Michael. Um, so I think. Yeah, I'll probably just sort of stop it finish, here and take a few more questions. 